Tonight, from London, a unique television experience. For the first time, leading personalities from the theatre, television, sport, politics and Fleet Street have gathered for an audience with Dame Edna Everidge. And among those present for this glittering occasion are Joanna Lumley, Ted Moult, Marjorie Prudes, Tessa Wyatt, Susie Quattro, the Marquis of Bath, Jill Gascoigne, John Conte, and Hazel O'Connor. And Stanley Baxter, Madeline Bell, the Reverend William Badley, Shirley Williams, Ned Sherry, Rula Lenska, Nigel Dempster, Lord Longford, Frank Ifield, and Simon Williams. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the Barry Humphreys conglomerate and London Weekend Television proudly present the first lady of World Theatre, Melbourne housewife, mother and megastar, Dame Edna Everidge. from my son, Singer. He designed it himself. Still a few little pins in it, as a matter of fact. But it is gorgeous and soft and summery and chiffonny, no matter what time of the year or in what part of this funny old war-torn world of ours you're living in at the moment. I know that a lot of you, particularly in the studio audience, are wondering what the dickens you're here for tonight. And I know that a lot of our listeners, or those with vision, viewers, <laughs> viewers and are wondering what is their favourite old megastar doing on this little spot on the dial? <laughs> What's our lovely Dame Edna doing on this channel, you're wondering? And the reason is very, very simple. I spend a lot of time being a modern person in meetings. I'm always in a meeting. When I have people ring, I just say I'm in a meeting. <laughs> and I was in a meeting the other day with some of my, uh, what are they called, uh, little, um, little people, little consultants? my little marketing people, and uh, they came up with some pretty spooky statistics. They said to me, they said, you know, you don't just appeal to discriminating and discerning people, they made and they said, you also appeal to people like London Weekend viewers, and I thought to myself, <laughs> I must make myself available. I must, I must heed the statistics of my market research people, <laughs> and that's why I'm here. I'm making myself, quite simply, available and accessible. Access Edna was the name we nearly gave this funny little experimental show because that's very much what it is. And you know what other superstar would put themselves on the line like this? I mean this modestly. But can you think of a single other woman in my position who just come out into a studio with a whole lot of little, little mini celebrities studded all over there? <laughs> you know, little familiar faces and little not so familiar faces too. And just absolutely subject themselves to relentless interrogation. Tonight the cameras are going to be poking and probing in little parts of me that have never been poked or probed before. <laughs> <laughs> it's a risky sort of a thing to do, but I don't mind. Because we Australians are like that. I happen incidentally to be an Australian. <laughs> we are, we're an open type of person. My life is an open book. But there are some little things, there are little nooks, little crannies of my personality that have never been probed properly. And if you should ask a little question tonight, because questions is the name of the game, the bottom line, to use a little phrase I've picked up, the bottom line is question time. And you might just ask a key question here tonight that could unleash, goodness me, disclosures. There are going to be some bombshells, there are little things, there are little things I've been hoarding away and I, didn't, I thought I'd never be telling them, but I've got a feeling I'm going to be tonight. I have little, almost, oh, horrible. <laughs> And I feel, you know, things between me and my gynaecologist, I'll put it that way. <laughs> I will. Uh, so, I don't 
don't think I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be doing all the talking tonight either. Uh, Ninety-nine percent of it, perhaps, but no more because I believe <laughs> that there should be a little margin for you, darlings. There really, really should be. So, without any further ado, I think I should just throw it open. Uh, and as little Bette Midler said, fasten the seatbelt. I think it was Bette, one of those wonderful people. <laughs> so, it's socket to me, audience, please. Question times. Yes. Dame Edna, welcome Hello, back. Hello, darling. Hello. <laughs> On behalf of all us lucky possums, we'd like to know where you've been. You mean since... Since last we saw you here. Oh, yes, I have been keeping a pretty low profile. Hello. And should we know you? <laughs> should we... <laughs> What's your name, darling? Simon. Hello, Simon. Of course. Isn't that awful, Simon? <laughs> oh, Simon D. I wondered what had happened. <laughs> survivor and so am I. You know, that's my new word, survivor. Everyone's a survivor. Um, Simon, I have not been flaunting myself of late because I believe in just occasional little exposure such as this. I believe in just suddenly appearing. Don't you think a lot of superstars, you see them all the time? I've been around, mind you, flitting in and out, little headscarf on in Fenwick's in Bond Street. <laughs> and then poking around some of the shops. And it's weird. It gives me a spooky feeling. It, hello. It gives me a spooky feeling because people don't recognise me. You know, they just think I'm an ordinary old, funny old superstar. <laughs> they don't realise who I really am. Um, that's where I've been, mostly. And uh, I've been working on some of my little things, my other little book, book or two, and photography I'm into. As you know, little Diane Keaton is taking snaps all over the place now. Linda McCartney, Gina Lollabridge was the first, wasn't she, listeners? And I've taken that because I'm doing a book called The Compassionate Camera of Edna Everidge. <laughs> I'm going to take pictures of disadvantaged people, mainly. <laughs> In fact, I was hoping to take a few little pictures of you tonight. But, <laughs> dear audience. But that will make up a wonderful book because it'll be moving. People will say, oh, what, you know, these are documents. They're not just photographs. They'll say they're documents and statements. I'm hoping people will say that of my work. <laughs> so I've been active in so many fields, Simon. This is a fragmentary answer to your question. I could go on. <laughs> <laughs> I hope to. For about 55 minutes. <laughs> Please. Oh, Frank. Frank I feel, you adorable Australian. A little hand for Frank I feel. Uh, your ladyship, um, uh, can I can I call you uh, can I call you Edna? Frank. Yes, of course you know. That's all right. You can. This is informal, isn't it? We've all heard you sing, and we've all been astounded by it. And uh, I was just wondering, two questions, in fact: uh, who taught you to sing, and uh, whether you got your money back? <laughs> oh, Frank, you're being satirical now, you naughty old, <laughs> wicked old possum you are. <laughs> Now, I am a self-taught artist. I haven't had official formal training, Frank. I won many years ago in the 1950s in Melbourne, where I come from, which is a l gorgeous little place. You know it, Frank. Oh, I know well. I won the lovely Mother Quest, and it was not a singing thing. <laughs> it was just a naturalness. It was an award for naturalness. And I think I'd still, and I say this, I hope not without too much conceit, I think I could still win it. Because I'm a natural person. I am, and a very, very natural, straightforward sort of a person. And I don't think, I think some people can learn to sing, but mine is a totally untrained voice, and I know I see you looking at me with disbelief, Frank, but it is an untrained voice. The very first time is saying, though, I mean, did you... Is this the third question, Frank? No. <laughs> I was, I was just interested, did, did you sort of make a mega star immediately? In the no, I didn't. It wasn't instant mega stardom, Frank, again. And this brings me back. I, it happens so slowly. People say to me, you know, they come up to me in Harrods, they say, oh, what's it like? <laughs> they say, what's it like to be an overnight success? And I say, mm, it's not an overnight success. I say to them as they pluck at my frock. <laughs> We do. We work on year after year. We polish, we hone, don't we, Frank? But you're still honing at your talent, huh? 
Can't you still polishing and buffing away at that little gem that was given to you so many years ago? <laughs> yes. Now, I see a gorgeous little man here with a little dog collar on who was twink tweaking at the sky a minute ago. Question from you, darling. Dear Your Grace, um, we all know you're one of the world's most marvellous communicators. <laughs> if I asked you to preach, what would be your text? Oh, goodness me. <laughs> <laughs> this is the penalty, I suppose, for an unrehearsed show. <laughs> I should say, and I, I think it would be a silly and a empty, a hollow kind of a show, wouldn't it, if there wasn't a little bit of depth so kindly, if I may say so, introduced by a little person of the cloth there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got a little text. I don't know what part of the Bible it's from, but I think it's something like, I translated from the Greek. <laughs> When I get to the end of my tether, I hope you're at the other end. And that's what I... <laughs> you know, that's a favour. That's been a... It's been a... It has been a... Look at here, by the way. Ah, uh, notice, I don't know... I don't know where to associate you with Russell or the BBC or London Weekend. <laughs> Be hopping about, aren't you, you little... <laughs> little bit of a maverick, but you're keeping your foot in both camps, which I think is a... <laughs> And you know, one of my first appearances on television in Britain was on Russell's show. And he's got a lovely way with a lot of people don't get the point of you. But I do. <laughs> I do. Because it's funny this not getting the point of people. Don't you think? <laughs> not getting the point of people. You know, it's, there's no two ways about it. There's plenty of people who don't get the point of me. Not plenty. Hardly any, as a matter of fact. <laughs> I don't get the point of view. Luckily, isn't it people you don't care for particularly? <laughs> Generally speaking, don't give much, don't care much for you either. And I think that's one of the funny little things that helps us get by in this silly old world of ours. I'll edit that little bit out, but because it's a little too philosophical. <laughs> <coughs> yes, the fat man. <laughs> I know that face of yours too, don't I? I'm always, I don't know. Uh... <laughs> Do, I'm always looking for, for a more exciting alternative to the wheat, oats and barley and I'm fascinated how you've stimulated the interest in gladioli. I'm wondering, now I'm thinking of growing a few acres, if by the time they come to fruition they'll be completely vulgarised. In other words... <laughs> So, do you know, I've had letters from people saying, florists, saying that people have stopped buying Gladys and sending them to hospitals. <laughs> because, that, because I have them in my wonderful shows, they're inclined to think there's something wrong with them. Isn't that a funny way of thinking? It really is, isn't it? And so I suppose that's what you mean by vulgarised, that they've become a bit too popular. I've popularised an entire bloom. It was practically unknown, you know, before I... <laughs> It is an Australian wildflower. They grow. <laughs> Honestly, they do. They grow like weeds. You know when I have to go down to get my letters? We have in Australia letterboxes. At the end of our little front... We have beautiful... So we don't have... Our houses aren't all joined together to stop them falling over. <laughs> like yours. We have lovely front gardens with, with lovely paths. And at the end of the path, there's a little Conti. I can see him over there. You adorable tinted person. <laughs> I've never seen him with his clothes on. <laughs> I uh, go down to my front gate and I've got a letterbox in the form of a koala bear with a slit in it. <laughs> I have. And I look to see if there's any male little authors and counter offers, you know, little London What's Name television, all these people clamouring Arts Council begging me to take over this and that. <laughs> and, um, I have to cut, I have to hack my way through a forest of gladdies, I do, because overnight, <coughs> overnight they grow up, it's, I feel like, the, what is the sleeping beauty surrounded by these things? 
I don't know how you'd grow them. You probably got green thumbs or whatever. <laughs> I, thought a good way... a se... I thought there was a secret language which I don't know about. Well, there is. I think you've got to love a flower. Just as you've got to... If anything's going to grow, if anything's going to prosper, I think even a little relationship with an audience, I think there's got to be the feeling of a certain amount of warmth and niceness about it, don't you? I think niceness is the bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> isn't it? Your Grace, I think it is. <laughs> I really do. I think it is. And flowers feel it. I know that. I've seen Glad's giving me a funny old-fashioned look when I've... <laughs> I have when I've not been in the mood for them. I'm not always in... Look, I've got alternative flowers here. <laughs> I never thought that'd happen. <laughs> Trust London Weekend to get it a bit wrong. <laughs> Incidentally, don't you love this set, viewers? <laughs> Apparently it's based on Mussolini's lounge room. I believe... <laughs> this chair which is Art Deco of course my son really introduced Art Deco <laughs> my son Kenny but I don't think this is the real thing I think this could be Art Dago I think it could be <laughs> I, think, I think it might have been made in Italy and you know I was up uh, I went down to Pompeii which is fascinating and I had a look I've never been to Pompeii and you know as you know that Mount Edna my namesake exploded <laughs> and all the pumice stones buried all those people. It was a bit... Pompeii was the London of its time, you know. <laughs> Apparently it was. And when I was looking around, it was... You know, you saw all these people lying around in a state of total inertia. <laughs> and the comparison was absolutely uncanny. <laughs> the people were just sort of lying in paralyzed. Well, of course, they were mummies, practically. And what they did, the archaeologists used to come when they were looking for the bit of pumice rub off the ciggy stains. <laughs> they would in Pompeii. I've just been there. It's fresh in the mind. They'd dig and they'd find these poor little old Pompeians lying around and they'd put a little hole in their heads and fill them up with plaster of Paris and they'd turn like Madame to swords, only, only realistic. And they'd be lying around. And it occurs to me, wouldn't it be spooky? Oh, isn't it a horrible thing? But wouldn't it be ghastly if Hampstead exploded or whatever's the nearest <laughs> volcano to here? I think, <laughs> I think it is. Mount Hampstead is an extinct. <laughs> well, it's thought to be extinct, but I think it's dormant. I think it is. It blew up, the pumice stones came over here and we were all buried and centuries, millions of years later, people dug us all up. They'd wonder what the dickens we were doing. <laughs> say you were there, they'd say, what all this? It must be a religious service. <laughs> they'd say, these people are worshipping a goddess. And <laughs> they would. But you know, they wouldn't be too far from the truth either, would they? <laughs> Don't know how I got onto that subject. <laughs> Hazel. Uh, have you ever fallen foul of this business, i.e. stripping for fame or the casting catch? <laughs> stripping for fame? Well, look, I have been approached. A person did approach me. <laughs> a person who runs, I'm not going to say it, it is a place in Soho. And it's... <laughs> it's well, it's supposed to be quite, you know, you know rather... A, sort of high-class type of a place, and he did ask me to be an attraction there. And I said, Paul, no. I said, no. I said, I said, I have a mind, I have a body, and I try to keep them as far apart as possible. Hey, man, but following on from your last question, it's quite obvious to all of us that you're in amazing physical shape. I'd just like to know how it is that you manage it. I mean, do you, do you play ping pong or do you uh, play tennis or what do you do? Windsurf. <laughs> I do. I love windsurfing and I can do it in the Dorchester. <laughs> I can. I, all I do is stand there in a negligee and turn on the hairdryer. I do. You can get the illusion of it. Depending, I mean, you can put the hairdryer more or less wherever you like. <laughs> you can. And believe me, ladies, it is, it is absolutely... I mean, it beats standing on your head in the ladies' room. <laughs> so I hate those things you've got to nudge with your elbow, don't you? <laughs> Mind you, I think they're better than towels. I think they're better than those yucky old roller towels, don't you? Don't you hate it when you have to go into the bathroom, as the Americans call it? 
And don't you go hated when you have to pop in there and there's a towel, one of those roller machines, Lord Longford. And <laughs> you've probably got them in the House of Lords and you go in there <laughs> and it's a horrible squidged up thing, all black and you want, don't want to use it. You go out with your hands dripping instead and someone immediately wants to shake your hand or something. <laughs> and you've just come out of there and they wonder what the dickens it is. <laughs> rush of hot air but I'm a windsurfer and I you know it's within that my health comes from I don't have time for actual a bit of jogging Jackie Kennedy and I used to do a lot of jogging <laughs> I introduced her to that but that's about all I've got a bicycle in my little bathroom and I do a little bit of that but I've neglected it slightly of late let's have a commercial break that the ratings are soaring for this show <laughs> and everyone in the United Kingdom without exception is watching at the moment <laughs> isn't this amazing aren't you be lucky to be here <laughs> it's cunning now this is an Ednathon isn't it you might call it it's not a telephone it's an Ednathon it really is and you know well, there again, here am I just sharing my experience, hope and strength with my public. Oh, Morgan, I've been given so much in this life. The least I can do is to give a little bit away to keep it. That's my motto. That's what I'd say if I had a little sermon to give. I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to be asked, too, by a little sky pilot sitting in the audience. <laughs> yes? I wonder if you ever thought of going into politics and raising the whole tone of public life. <laughs> You've got the iron lady in power in England at the moment. I'm not the iron, I'm more or less the aluminium lady, you could call <laughs> Or the formica lady, perhaps. Because though I'm tough, I'm a little bit of softness about me, and I think I'm a bit too soft and a little bit too caring. I think a little bit too soft, a little bit too caring to go into that hard old world of politics. In my job, you see, I have to be aloof from politics. So many people model themselves on me. I see women in the street, it's almost like I think, oh, what's that mirror doing there? It's women. <laughs> Not always women either. Who? <laughs> it is, it's, it's, shall we say it's members of the human race? <laughs> modelling themselves, some of them pitifully sick, modelling themselves on me. It is. They like clones. That's the bottom line of it. <laughs> That's the bottom line of it. Clones they are. And so because people follow me so scrupulously, I have to keep as far as I can detached from the political life of Britain. I'm a bit like Margaret Thatcher in that respect. <laughs> be called in for an emergency I would I'd be a bit like kiss a sort of a Kissinger figure in the background and people would say oh I bet I Edna was behind that bit of legislation you know? oh. <laughs> yes we're all oh Lord Bath yes darling uh, Dame Edna as you may remember about two years ago we visited that wonderful country the Australia and had the privilege of seeing you in your show uh, I was just felt though however that how could I put it that members of the aristocracy and stately homes were rather thin on the ground. Right. My home, Everidge Hall, is a stately home. <laughs> and you know, how often does this happen that a living person has their home turned into a showplace, into a shrine? This is uncanny. It's giving me little goose pimples, as a matter of fact. In fact, they're getting a bit sharp. I could lad them a frock on them. <laughs> because, you know, my home is, it's not of the size of yours. I haven't got the old little vintage cars and lions and tigers, darling, but it is... Well, there's an old Oldsmobile in the garage, as a matter of fact, but it's on blocks. <laughs> yes, indeed, you are, by the looks of you. However, we keep a little wing, well, spare bedroom, which is more or less a wing, just in case, you know, my husband ever gets well and wants to go back there, but I... <laughs> Dame Edna. Yes. Don't you think that um, your continued absence from your husband Norm's bedside, hospital bedside, may I add, is uh, a threat to your own marriage? <laughs> you know, when I 
said I wanted any question you cared to ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping that the subject of law wasn't going to crop up. <laughs> are not as they have been with my husband and this is a funny little spooky bit of the show that's coming up now <laughs> because my husband has been in touch with legal people <laughs> and there's a silly little document that's been served on me about desertion <laughs> now I think this is tragic that the average marriage is on the rocks and I never thought I'd say that <laughs> Silicon chip prostate. <laughs> he has. I pump money and I pump money into that man. The drip, even his bedside, even his saline drippers from Asprey's. It is. <laughs> I've done everything I can for Norm. I've, I've, the top medical people have been prodding away at him for years. <laughs> And you know, he's a lot more mobile and he has made out to me. Of course, I put him on the telex machine. He can contact me any time he likes. <laughs> well, he can't actually, but I can contact him. <laughs> and I'm in touch with the sister and that's, I'm afraid, what probably the main trouble is because my husband has fallen into the hands of an unscrupulous woman. And I can say this now because I know he hasn't got the telly at his present condition. <laughs> Nurse Thelma Younghusband is his, uh, the person <laughs> who's mainly in charge of the things that happen to my husband at the moment. And she is working on old Norm, and she's been working on his mind. He's a tool in her hands, I can tell you that, Russell. <laughs> my husband is a... Every night at blanket bath time she works on that man. <laughs> she's been poisoning his mind against me, and she's been making him write a book. And I hope something, I hope we can repair this terrible rift because I'm not, particularly in the present state, because I'm expecting a menopause baby. <laughs> I, no, I, I have to elaborate that <laughs> because I don't want you looking at my figure, it's not going to happen that way. I was in the States and I realised this got some sort of a bank, a celebrity sperm bank you can go to. Isn't that a horrible thought? But it's true. And you could go there, you could have a Nobel Prize winner's kitty. <laughs> or indeed, you could have Warren Beatty's kitty. <laughs> Mind you, everyone's had that. <laughs> you could. The fact of the matter is that I was toying with the idea of having this little creature, you know, and I thought it can all be done scientifically. You don't have to change my frocks or anything like that. It's all happening in the laboratories and there's and I thrust it into my hand and there'll be a little bit of publicity. I'll be popping up in little Nigel's column. Hello, darling. It just saw, just saw little Nigel then. So let's hope all this works out. But I do object to something that appeared in one of your columns recently about me and my hairdresser on the Costa Smeralda. <laughs> say this because I've always liked you I know you're a little fellow Australian you've worked and schemed to get a few little connections over here <laughs> however I saw something I mean this could have upset Norm terribly if it had got to him because I have a hairdresser called his name is Samson as a matter of fact <laughs> they're in the salon they call him Delilah <laughs> Hazel, you know, he gives me a little work over a little scapula he works on with his little fingers. He's got a wonderful sort of voile shirt open to the navel, a little med medallion around his neck. He's a darling, a bit of a Latin looking type, and he was a friend of my son Kenny, as a matter of fact, introduced me to him. <laughs> and we travel around together, and he's a great comfort to me. He's tremendously, he's a chiropodist as well. <laughs> You know, if he's not working on one end of me, he's working on the other. <laughs> and you had to bring that, that up, and you said such poisonous things. I was very, very disappointed. I thought a Perth boy, too. <laughs> <laughs> Darling. Yes, little boy there. Dame Matthew, do you watch Dallas? Dallas watches me. <laughs> Russell Party. <laughs> yeah. you, thrown, uh, Dame Edna, you've thrown me into some confusion by the use of the word uh, menopause and a menopause baby, because when you were first on my I know show... I shocked a lot of people. Yes. <laughs> but when you were first on my show and nobody knew who you were, you did sort of 
Fast du bara... You did... You were at that time, I think, in your country called going round Catherine's Corner. And uh, you were sort of glowing a lot at that time. And I thought you, you probably were... <laughs> suffering at that time. I wonder if you'd like to take this opportunity of thanking me for the kind of help that I... <laughs> it's no show without punches at Russell Harley. <laughs> I heard you complaining in the paper the other day that London Weekend hadn't given you a farewell present. <laughs> You're into gratitude in a big way, aren't you, darling? <laughs> for everything. Well, I did thank him, didn't I, viewers? Yeah. I did thank him. I did say thank you to you, Russell, for doing that little show. You probably were so busy thinking of your question you didn't even hear me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about those references to something that happens to we women folk. Did you think that was tasteful? I didn't. <laughs> I mean, I think there are ways of talking about our processes and our drives and our juices and there are ways you don't. I'm sorry. Am I old-fashioned? I think I might be. <laughs> Lord Longford. Well, uh, would you agree we ought to take a much tougher line with pornography? Well, I have so little to do with it, Lord Longford. I... <laughs> I do. <laughs> Some of it, I must admit, is a bit tame and could be a bit tougher. <laughs> thing that I've got into now. You know, my little hairdresser has introduced me to a way of life I never thought was possible. <laughs> if ever you want a trim, I'll send him round here, darling. <laughs> but, uh, in Australia, of course, we don't have a problem with it because we don't... It's not there. People don't even know about it. They don't need it. They've got the kangaroos and the... <laughs> all the time, you know, just in their back gardens they just look out the window and they can, you know, they're free to see it. It's very difficult to censor that type of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a pretty little lass. Hello, darling. Hello, Aren't you Medna. pretty as a picture? Thank you. Hello. Oh, I love your little karate chops, too. <laughs> Dame Edna, I believe one of your sons is married. How do you get on with your daughter-in-law? I don't. <laughs> I should say this, and I don't mean this uncharitably, Your, your Grace. Joylene lives in England. She lives in a part which viewers probably watching this in Germany or in Japan won't know what I'm talking about. But <laughs> or in a space capsule. If this goes in a time capsule, people aren't going to know what Dickens we're talking about. <laughs> They'll know me. They'll know who I am from old <laughs> coins and things. <laughs> My daughter-in-law, Joylene, lives in a suburb called Clapham. Now, she thinks it's fashionable. It's pitiful, really. <laughs> She's waiting for it to become fashionable. She's <laughs> an old woman, I think, before that ever happens. She's into a thing called high tech. Have you ever heard of that? <laughs> high tech is when you leave all your conduits exposed. <laughs> She's got an old manhole cover as a butter dish, isn't that pathetic? <laughs> she does. She has her breakfast off a bit of galvanised iron. <laughs> You know those things outside skyscrapers which painters travel up and down on? <laughs> they, shift, they pull out the staircase and you go up and down on that, someone pulls a chain and they all wear crash helmets. <laughs> it's called high tech, it's pitiful, honestly. Give me old Art Deco any day of the week. <laughs> but uh, she's there with a little hatashi, that's what they call it, a little hibashi, like a barbecue. And on a little patio, the smell of her T-bones wafting over the underprivileged fences of Clapham. <laughs> She's so superior with me, that girl. It's, of course, I suppose it's difficult marrying a superstar's son. I don't want to say too much more about Joy Ann because she might be watching and she does try. She makes a pitiful effort to please me. A lot of people like her. A lot of people think she's quite attractive. I just can't see it, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> one more question before our little commercial break. Dame Edna, as you're one of the greatest, if not the greatest, writer of the 20th century, would you like to reveal to us what your favourite bedside reading is? Well, I love the novels of Melvin Bragg. I really do. 
I see Melvin here, who's come from Cumbria. It's a little island off the coast. <laughs> Melvin has written 12 books. Has anyone here read any of them? <laughs> has that, yes? <laughs> little boys there, don't write him off the minute, Melvin. <laughs> or we'll never catch up, will we, Possums? <laughs> too. This is Dame Edna Everidge for station identification. <laughs> this is not so much a show, to use an old Ned Sheeran expression. <laughs> not so much a show, but a time capsule. This is going to go into the archives. It's going to be looked at in millions of years' time. It's an interesting thing. It's part of technology creeping into my life. There's a little man nodding there. <laughs> nodding off, I think. <laughs> In the early 60s, when you played the establishment with uh, an audience of about seven and only one dress, were times very hard for you then? <laughs> You've got a memory like an elephant, haven't you? <laughs> you know, many years ago, there was this little place called the establishment in London. It was what was a little cubby hole, wasn't it, designed by Sean Kenny? It was a long, narrow thing. You thought it was the passage to something, but that was it. <laughs> Goodness me, what a passage to success it was, wasn't it? Because little Ned Sharon struggled along there for many, many moons. <laughs> Paul never came the ubiquitous figure he is today. <laughs> and David Frost, of course, started off there. And you know, it was one of my first little starting places, as you first said. And how right you are, Ned, that my following was pitifully small. Have you still got the dress? I've still got the frock, as I prefer to call it. <laughs> frock is Australian for dress. <laughs> and, uh, I've still got it. And I, you know, I, as a matter of fact, the Victoria and Albert Museum viewers have asked for a lot of my old cozies and they're going to have a beautiful uh, section showing fashions, Australian women's fashions through the ages, as exemplified by my gorgeous frock set. And uh, so just as well I didn't give them to you as you once requested. <laughs> forget much either, Ned. <laughs> <laughs> and now a question from a very adorable woman, Marjorie Proops. Hello, darling. Tell me, you must have a lot of problems in your life. Would you like to talk to me about them? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have problems. I've talked about a few. I've talked about the little heartbreak with Norm, and it is a heartbreak, and I, I wasn't going to discuss it, but I just thought I'd let it all hang out, Marge. Yeah. <laughs> I have written to you. Do you know that? <laughs> I have Did written you to you. You've answered on a number of aliases. <laughs> <laughs> wombat. I'm Wombat. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> I am. You remember the ones about the hysterectomy? They were all from me. <laughs> Most of my little queries, you said, I think you'd better speak to your medical advisor about it. <laughs> They're mainly your answers to me. But there are questions about human relationships too, Marjorie. And you know, you've got a sense of responsibility. I can tell that when I read you. And haven't you got your imitators? Who hasn't it so far, unfortunately? <laughs> On this network. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I believe people do me at parties. Did you know that? <laughs> let me know at least <laughs> can you imagine girls being done at parties and not even being there <laughs> I'm a phys very physical I'm a very sensuous person Marjorie very very sensuous and I have these feelings and I've very been deprived of a good deal of the physical side of marriage for a long time I have Wombat's never told you that has she <laughs> but I have and I've missed darling old Norm and he's been there being consoled by this little puzzy, this little type. <laughs> now, when I seek a little bit of consolation under the blower of a delightful hairdresser, <laughs> I get pilloried in little Niger's poison pen column. <laughs> I don't think it's fair. 
Anyway, Marjorie, I'm very pleased, and you, you are the acceptable face you are of journalism. May I say that? <laughs> and you have so much sweeter than your photographs. You really are. <laughs> is grey in the photographs I've got of her. She's grey and black and with little spots all over her. <laughs> she's... But you've got lovely tonings when I see you in the flesh. And of course you've got the face furniture. Marjorie Proops likes the glasses, viewers. She does face furniture, I call it. And you know, I do. I think the eyes are the window of the soul and I think the glasses are the Venetians. I think they are. <laughs> I like the Venetians. I frame... <laughs> I frame my eyes. I do. I've got so many different pairs. You will favour the one style, don't you, Marge? Let's have a little spectacle swapping session, shall we? <laughs> we can make a little spectacle of ourselves yes. after the show. <laughs> Apart from your menopausal baby, are there any other ambitions you still wish to fulfil? Please remember that this is hypothetical, this little kitty. I'm just toying with it. I'm thinking about it. Please. Is there anything else? Ambitions. Yes, I've got an ambition. Does this sound a little bit arty crafty? I'd like to be discovered by Bernard Levine. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, anyone here know Bernard Levine or heard of him? <laughs> he's very good. He's got a typewriter and he taps away and he's really got the gift of words. He's a wordsmith, viewers. And he keeps, he opens our eyes to things like Marla, Chopin, <laughs> and Dickens he's discovered. <laughs> discoveries and opens our eyes to wonderful new experiences. How thankful we must be. Think of those people who must have the rights to Dickens books thinking, oh, what a relief, this little Bernard Levine. <laughs> or all those shops think we've got this terrible, look, this terribly slow movers, these Wagner and Mahler records. How are we going to sell them? Suddenly in the paper appears a little article about, thank goodness, and then the demand starts. I would, of course, what's he going to discover next? That's what I want to know. Max Wall, the Beatles? Probably. <laughs> Of this little tawny creature. What's your name? Rula. What? Rula. Rula. I know you from one of the shows, don't I? Crossroads. Uh, Hello, <laughs> darling. Hello, Rula. Hello. You are adorable, too, with a little hint, is it, of Polish in you? That's right. Yes. Oh, I'd love to have a bit of Pole in me. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me this, darling. What's the matter with these people? <laughs> Just wondering, Dame Edna, um, looking at your you wonderful You're a gorgeous bone tonight. structure, Rula. <laughs> Attractive woman. Are you attached, are you? Uh, yes, I am. I'm I'd love to cuddle you. <laughs> I mean that in a normal and loving way. <laughs> no surprise you, Lord Longford, to hear that. <laughs> I was just wondering, as you're so obviously a, a leader in the fashion world, what your predictions are for the 80s? My predictions for the 80s in the fashion field. Well, my son, Kenny, designs most of my clothes. And as I say, this is hot off his singer. <laughs> this, this, this little sweet pea look that I introduced at the beginning of this show that you've been feasting your eyes on. And uh, I introduced the denim look. I introduced the tennis, the sporty look ruler. And I love that. What's that? A sound of a, a, it's a Brillo pad. <laughs> It's thing? a 20s flapper dress. It's beautiful. Does it scratch your ruler? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> my, my husband calls it my chain mail. He calls it that, does he? What an adorable sense of humour he makes. <laughs> I think the family that laughs together stays together, don't you? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I must say, whenever I see Norm, I burst out laughing. <laughs> Be together, don't you? Don't you? Yes. yes, final question. Could I ask yes. you a question about Australian sportsmen? Because you must know so many over the years of the, the great Australian sportsmen. Why are they su so successful and so prominent? What's their secret? I think it's the food, the open air life, the juicy steaks, the diet, the sunshine, and the total absence of any kind of intellectual distractions. <laughs> Satirical. I didn't mean that. Okay. You know it too, don't you? Uh, Rula Lenska, an adorable little pole if ever I saw one. Mention my clothes. I'm a style setter. I've got a frock back there. Have you got a second if I slip into it? Can I? Can I? 
the look. You're going to see women just like this. It's hard to believe that you are. I don't know how it all started. Goodness knows. I suppose I had a little phone call from little Bo Derek, practically an unknown. I get the calls. Little Streep. Little Merrill rings me up. Streep, isn't it? A f it's a funny name when you think of it. Streep, isn't it? Streep. You can you imagine your gynecologist saying, I'm afraid it's Streep. I think so. It's a bit like that. I but it sounds a bit like a funny thing that could go wrong with you. <laughs> Not with you, Russell, but with some of us. <laughs> little Bo rang me up and she said, one of these days, and I, I said, I'm sorry, I just can't play. She reminded me of a little Costa Smeralda meeting or something kind. And she said, I'm doing a show with a dwarf. She said, I'm... <laughs> I can't think what to wear. So I had a few ideas, a sort of ethnic sort of a thing, and uh, I came up with this kind of look, you know. I call it my fringe benefits, as a matter of fact. <laughs> However, that's the look, and uh, I thought you'd like to see it. I, um, I'd like to conclude by saying something, and I don't want this to seem silly and sentimental, but I'd like to say that if any of you have thought that this is a kind of one-woman virtuoso thing, it isn't. And so I want to say something about that in my own little way and I think I'm going to say it musically with the aid of this adorable ethnic looking person sitting here <laughs> it's little Laurie Holloway ladies and gentlemen at the keyboard <laughs> thank you darling <laughs> stage door, an audience crying out for more, that's what my public means to me, the loyal fans who queue for hours, the cards, the telegrams and the flowers, that's what my public means to me. See little faces looking up, grotesque with gratitude. <laughs> but from tiny tots to grannies, I love all your nooks and crannies. <laughs> That's what my public means to me. The Queen's birthday honours list, this lovely Cartier on my wrist. That's what my public means to me. A limousine, a sable coat, the lump that's rising in my throat. That's what my public means to me. Superstars may come and go, but there's no other. That folks identify with their own mother. To think
this an encore? <laughs> now the time has come to part. There's an ache inside my heart. Let's walk my Maybe for 